What's up, people? Welcome once again to the Shadow Gallery. I am, as always, your host, James Donnelly. And tonight, it's time for... New Comics, bitches! I grab your heart out. Boop. Okay. So, there's a lot to talk about, so let's get to it. Okay, so... The first thing that I wanted to talk about, first issue, first read that I wanted to talk about this week is Scarlet Spider number one. Yes, that's you you didn't hear that. There's nothing wrong with your set. Please do not adjust it. Yes, so Scarlet Spider is back. And it's not it's still a clone of Peter Parker, but it's Kane this time and not Ben Riley, who thought he was Peter Parker, and so on and so forth, is someone with you know. Any, anyway, so Kane was a bad guy. Spider Island became a good guy, killed the spy, you know, the Spider Queen, and then became kind of a hero, but kind of not. Um, and now is on the run. Uh, not so much on the one, just he wants to get the hell away from anything. So basically, if you ever wanted a kind of noirish and dark take on the character of Spider-Man, this is the comic that you want. Now, most people don't really want that. It's basically what this whole issue felt like to me, is that it was like the, the editors and the powers that be at Marvel... Uh, we're sitting around, and they asked each other, you know, what if we made a Spidey comic without the humor, and it felt a, a lot more like the 90s comic era? You know, the ones where every character had to be dark, and they had to have, you know, obscene amounts of pouches and hoodies and all these things. You know, the, the stuff that people hated about the 90s. Well, it's, some of it's here. But some of it's not here, and that is ultimately what is kind of the strength about Chris Yoss writing, uh, Ryan Stubbing's artwork. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's interesting. I, I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm not saying it's really good either. Um, it's 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 definitely above average. It's it's a good read. I'll just say it. It's a good read. It's about a three uh, three and a half out of five. And you know, ultimately. You know they do a commendable job, uh, but it it just it, it feels a little too dour. I mean, there's too much happening in this comic that's really on the dark side, and that's you know, it's it, it, I don't I don't think that's a good direction for Spidey. I, and I know it's I know it's not Peter Parker. I know so get off my back, but and I know it's Kane, and we're exploring this darker Spider-Man, and that can be okay, but. I just, um, I don't know. We're going to have to see where this takes us, ultimately. You know, and in, and in the, and actually the back of the issue, uh, Chris Yost actually talks about how much he loves the 90s, that how much he loves the pouches and the hoodie and the, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, oh, that kind of makes me think of Chris Yost in a little bit different of a way. But Chris Yost has done some great things at Marvel, uh, one of those things we're also going to talk about, uh, not maybe in this session, but certainly in this, uh, the, our uh, broadcast tonight, if you will. Um, so that was, it, it was good, but certainly uh, could have been better. Um, on the flip side, we have uh, Amazing Spider-Man, and god damn it. This is why I told myself I would be more prepared this time, but I'm not. Uh, sorry, sorry, number 677. So, this is Mark Wade who is stepping in for Dan Slott because he's doing a two-part arc of Spidey that crosses over with Daredevil, number 8, that will come out next week. And this is involving the Black Cat. Now, it's a rollicking, raucous tale of Spidey and Hornhead and the Black Cat. So, I mean, this is... This is a wonderful, wonderful issue. Five out of five across the board. It's pretty much a perfect comic. It's a perfect issue of comics. Wade here, he plays it fast and loose and really incredibly fun. 
with the characters that he has. Obviously, he knows how he's writing Daredevil right now. And obviously, this is someone who has a real solid grasp on Spider-Man, despite the fact that I've never seen him write Spider-Man before. But he really knows what he's doing. And if, there were, and if Dan Slott were to ever leave, which I'm sure one day he will, if he were to ever leave Spider-Man, this would be the guy that I would, I would want Mark Wade to take over. Because this is just, it's fun, it's footloose, it has really great action beats, it has awesome character moments. Uh, Emma, Rios, Emma, Rios is, uh, eh, Emma Rios, artist on this issue, a lot of this, uh, her art kind of rubs some people the wrong way. I personally, I love it. I think it's terrific. She does a great job. She she makes it really dynamic, um, and it just you know it's just like a you know it's like a good kick upside the head. The kind of kick upside the head that makes you feel good. <laughs> there aren't too many of those, but this is one of them. It's just, you know, we've got Spidey and Dee Dee. They're trying to, you know, they're basically teaming up to find out who exactly framed Black Cat for this theft at Horizon. And, you know, maybe could have, but, you know, it's, that's the whole thing. That's where it gets fun. And, you know, again, this is just one of those issues that reminds you why you read comics. It reminds you of the love. When a certain writer and artist team up and they show you, okay, this is what we can do. We're going to bring you some great stuff. And they do. And they just make that decision right off the bat. This is going to be a great comic. You're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be really cool to read. And you're going to be like quoting it in your head for days. Just terrific stuff. So, again, five out of five for... Amazing Spider-Man 677. Now, Wolverine and the X-Men, number four. <laughs> Again, I mean, this is another, you know, the future isn't what it used to be. And that's just the beginning of the surprises here. Because we've got, obviously, we've got some new students here. We've got something weird going on with Angel. Again, I haven't read X-Force. I, okay, I read X-Force 19.1, the point one issue. I did not review it last week, although I intended to. I would give that maybe a two and a half out of five, only because I don't care one bit for the Age of Apocalypse shit. It's just, that's me. Uh, I thought it was at least admirably done, but it's just, it's a personal, it's, an, it's a matter of personal taste. I don't care for it. I've never even really cared for Apocalypse. But basically what we have here, you know, Aaron, you know, Jason Aaron, you know, bringing a great deal of, you know, uh, information to bear here, but I mean, it's smart. It's really well paced. There's no unnecessary putting in of a lot of exposition here. It's really very, very funny. You know, I mean, just talking about the little bamps and how they raided uh, <laughs> uh, Logan's martial arts collection. That's why there was an injury. And then, of course, you know, Kitty saying something about, well, just as long as they didn't raid Logan's other video stash. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I was missing Chris Pichalo's art here a little bit, but uh, what's it? Mar uh, Nick Bradshaw uh, takes uh, takes art duties in this issue, and it's really very good. This is a four and a half out of five. Uh, again, it, it's, it's, it's really close to being perfect. The surprise at the end, the big whoa at the end, is it's a pretty big whoa. And I don't know how it happened, and that's an interesting thing. It's it happened in two comic books this week, and two characters that Joss Whedon uh, is very uh, comfortable with, shall we say, <laughs> very much in his wheelhouse of characters. Uh, I know I'm kind of playing this fast because there's a lot of stuff to get through, and I want to get through it pretty quickly so I can just get this out there for you to see. Uh, Secret Avengers. Uh, and this was, shit, again, I didn't write this stuff down. Why didn't I do this? You know why? Because I'm stupid. Um, game bag. See, if I didn't have to worry about rights issues, I could actually keep this shit out. And in here, number 21. Okay. So Secret Avengers number 21. This was the finale of Ellis's run on Secret Avengers. Uh, it came to an end, not with a bang, but kind of with a whimper. It, 
he, he does a tight story here. Basically, you know, we're still, you know, it's this com this common thread that, you know, the comic essentially has had almost from the beginning about, well, it has from the beginning, about the Shadow Council. And they are the bad guys that the Secret Avengers have to face down here. And this is, a, you know, Ellis has had fun playing around with all the different characters from the Secret Avengers throughout and hasn't really done anything with Cap. So this is kind of Cap's issue. And they, you know, they determine that there is a leak where there shouldn't be a leak. They have to plug it, and it turns out to be the one person, of course, that you wouldn't think would be the leak. So um, it, it's just, it, it left me feeling a, a little chilly. And not just because of the actual ending, which is pretty horrible. I mean, not, the act itself is horrible, but it's just kind of, I, I wanted some more emotional impact from this, from this issue. It could have been a little bit better balanced. You know, there's this kind of higher concept science stuff mixed in with some good action, but ultimately there's just, I, I wanted this, I wanted Ellis to be leaving this book saying, you know what, I fucking nailed it. And he probably did. But in my mind, you know, as, as much as I've come to respect Alice just from this run on Secret Avengers alone, and that's a, that's a lot. This is, you know, it's taken me a lot to really get on board with Warren Alice, but I finally did, and this is, you know, this is proof that he can do really good comics, but it just didn't work for me. Uh, I felt that it was... It just lacked the punch of Ellis's other issues, just despite the, the you know the, the the good ending that it had. I thought that it ended well. It's just that some of this the in between stuff just didn't quite work for me. So that's that's kind of that. Um, so let's talk. Uh, well, since we're doing Marvel now, I guess we'll kind of keep going here. Uh, so Ultimate Comics X Men number six. Uh, Kitty has to seriously step up. Has to seriously step up in this issue because she's already kind of stepped in it, uh, because she basically blows Rogue's plan. Because what you know, Kitty and the other quote unquote you know X Men don't realize is that Stryker has you know he's a mutant himself and he has power over technology. But Kitty just essentially killed him. So, you know his last wishes that were transmitted out to all the Nimrods were to basically destroy all, you know, as many mutants as they possibly could. Uh, you know, events of Ultimate Hawkeye uh, start bleeding into this particular issue, and, it, you know, so basically it's, it's kind of fitting, you know, you see how it's fitting into the rest of the Ultimate Universe right now. Whether or not we'll actually get that with uh, Ultimate Spider-Man, that will be something else completely. And I don't know if it belongs there, because this... X-Men, Ultimate X-Men is much more kind of rooted in the uh, kind of Ultimates world, if you will. Uh, Ultimate Spider-Man seems a little bit separate, but at least for now. Uh, but again, we're just a stat, well, I shouldn't really say that. Issue 5, which was great, uh, kind of established that Miles Morales is definitely amongst the Ultimates here. But just the tone of that book, tonally, it's a different kind of book than the other Ultimates books. So... Uh, you know, Rogue obviously being the easiest target for suspicion here, and of course is the best choice for the mission that she was given by HOLY SHIT! I didn't see that coming. And you probably didn't either, but of course... As I'm sure you know, nobody stays dead in the comic book world for very long. Unless they are, you know, the unassailable, um, which is, I, I think there are three deaths in the entire pantheon of comics that can never be undone, that are Ben Parker, you can't bring him back in any way, shape, or form, unless it's like, a, you know, a robot or a memory or whatever, and you can't bring back uh, 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 Thomas and Martha Wayne. So, but anyway, Spencer, you know, really continues, to, you know, Nick, Nick Spencer, you know, really brings up the action, gr creates good, great character beats with Kitty kind of phasing everybody to protect them from the Nimrods. That's, that's great stuff. I'm really loving the way this has turned out and ramped up. This is a four and a half out of five, easy for Ultimate X-Men number six. So we're going to come back and we're going to talk about a lot more comics, okay? So stay tuned.